Hello and welcome to CPH Session 19, Inferential Statistics, Making Comparisons and Conclusions from Data. This is Part A, Variability in the Normal Distribution and Calculating Z-Scores. In this section, we'll talk about what the normal distribution is and how to calculate normal or Z-Scores and also what we can do if data is not normally distributed. So before we get started, I'd just like to demonstrate to you what we can do with inferential statistics. And let's go back to the example of the Virginia Republican primary exit poll results that we looked at in session 18. If you remember, we saw that, according to our sample, about 12% uh, of Virginia primary voters had a high school degree or less. However, we only sampled 1,523 voters out of the more than 1 million. So we can't say for certain that the population's distribution of education levels is identical to our samples. Instead, we have to acknowledge that there is some margin of error. In fact, we expect that the true proportions may lie within these bounds that are shown here on this figure. The margin of error represents our uncertainty in the situation and it will be an important foundation for inferring conclusions about our data. And we'll talk about sampling variability and uncertainty in parts A, B, and C of this session. I'd also like us to look back at how those education levels were distributed among the five candidates at that time. We observe that it looks like there is some difference in voter preference among the education levels. For example, uh, less educated voters seem to prefer Trump. Uh, with inferential statistics, we can try to answer the question of, is the choice of candidate different among the education levels? And to answer that question, we have to calculate those dreaded p-values. Um, and it turns out that when we do that, that for Trump, Rubio, and for Kasich, our so-called p-value is low, and that allows us to say that the differences in voter choice among education levels is probably not due to random chance or sampling variability. And so the difference that we see in our sample may, in fact, be something that's real in the overall population. And that activity there is uh, in a field that's called hypothesis testing. And We'll cover those concepts in parts D through G. Okay, so let's now start with part A. We'll start by looking at the normal distribution. Do you remember from session 18 the three ways we can describe continuous data? Hopefully you recall that we can describe its location or central tendency, its dispersion or how spread out the data is, and its shape. And I mentioned at that time that we can use theoretical functions known as probability density functions or PDFs to describe the ideal shape of our data. And in fact, there are many PDFs described in literature. However, the, the most famous is the normal distribution function. The normal distribution function is a theoretical PDF that is perfectly symmetric about its mean. In this case, the mean is zero, so it's perfectly symmetric on either side of zero. And secondly, it has a shape that looks like a bell. Uh, it was first described by Carl Friedrich Gauss, so you may even see it referred to as the Gaussian distribution. Its simplicity lies in the fact that we only need two quantities to define a normal distribution, the mean and the standard deviation. We use the population means and standard deviations here because we're theoretically defining the distribution of the entire population. And here's the equation for the normal distribution function. The value y here is equal to this function's formula at any given value of x. As you can see, the other terms here in the formula are fixed values for the standard deviation uh, and the mean 
and pi. And if we increase the mean, the curve shifts to the right. Uh, if the mean decreases, the curve shifts to the left. If we increase the standard deviation, the curve stretches out. And if the standard deviation decreases, the curve is compressed. So you can see we can create an infinite number of normal curve configurations. And the value of y shown in green here is the theoretical probability of observing a value x in our theoretical probability model. But more importantly, the area under the curve, such as this one, that goes from the value 1.5 to the value 2.5, is the theoretical proportion of observations we would expect between those two values. Now here we have a population mean of zero and a population standard deviation of one. And that generates this normal curve that we see. And in fact, this is called the standard normal curve. And we'll come back to it later. And the air, so the area here that's shown, it's shaded, represents the proportion of observations that we would expect on average to be between 1.5 and 2.5. So I ask you, can you estimate that area? What would you say the area under that curve that's shaded is? Well, we can start by saying uh, it looks like a trapezoid. Uh, so the base goes from 1.5 to 2.5, so it's a base length of 1. Um, and the average uh, height of that trapezoid is maybe about 6 or 7%. So 1 times the about 6 or 7%, we'd say maybe that area is about 6 or 7% probably. It turns out when I compute the exact area under the curve using the normal distribution function, I find that the answer is just about 6%. So in other words, we would expect on average to see about 6% of our observations fall between those values of 1.5 and 2.5 using this theoretical model. Um, keep in mind, though, that normal curves are theoretical and no real data is truly perfectly normally distributed. Uh, the tails have no ends, and they actually stretch to infinity. But as you get beyond three or four standard deviations, uh, it has really tiny probability values, very close and near to zero. Now, uh, some data is approximated well by the normal curve. If we, say, measure blood pressure within a sample of 113 men and perform descriptive statistics, we might find that the sample mean uh, is 123.6 millimeters mercury and that the stamp sample standard deviation is 12.9 millimeters mercury. And if we superimpose the normal curve using those values uh, measured in the, po uh, in the sample as the assumed population means the standard deviation, if we impose that on the histogram we would see this and here we can see that the normal curve does closely follow what we see in the histogram. On the other hand, if we record the length of stay in a hospital for 500 patients and do the same thing, we would see that the normal curve does not approximate this data set very well. It's skewed to the right. So it's important that before we try to apply principles of inferential statistics, it's important that we look at the shape of the data. Many techniques in inferential statistics inherently assume that the data is normally or nearly normally distributed. And if our data is not, we are misusing the approaches that I'm going to present to you in these coming parts. I will, however, give you a bit of a workaround for that situation at the end of this part A. So now that we know what the normal distribution is, let's use it to calculate the normal, or z-scores. Uh, we could also say that we are standardizing our data. In summary, z-scores tell us how many standard deviations away from the mean any given observation 
is. Let's take a simple example. If we uh, say that we have a sample and the mean of that sample is 2 and the standard deviation is 0 0.5, what is the z-score of one of our observations whose value is 3? Well, we can see that if we start at 2, which is the mean, and we move one standard deviation, we get to 2.5. If we move another standard deviation, we get to 3. So we can see that 3 would be two standard deviations away from the mean. So the z-score is exactly 2 in that case. So the formula for z is this. A z-score is computed uh, as the observation minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. So in my example, we see that it's 3 minus 2, which is the mean, divided by the standard deviation of 0 0.5, and that's how we get to 2. Uh, in other words, the z-score is 2, and our observation is exactly two standard deviations in the positive direction away from the mean. And the z-score allows us to look at where our observation occurs along the standard normal curve that I showed you earlier. And using that, we can see the area under the curve and make inferences about the data, that data point. Uh, we do this using tables that are available in, in textbooks, they're available online, and they might look like what I'm showing here. Um, we can also find these values using functions in Excel or any stats program like Stata. Um, so in my case, I found that the z was 2.0. So I look at this table and I say that 97.72% of observations can be expected to be less than that observation, less than 3. Now, if I wanted to get this answer in Excel, we could use the formula norm.dist for normal distribution. So its syntax requires four inputs, 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay. First, we need our observation value, we need the mean, we need the standard deviation, and then we need a logical argument. So in that last input, we enter either true or false. If we want Excel to tell us the value of the normal curve function, meaning the height of the curve, then we would put in false there. If we want the cumulative area under the curve, like what's shown here, uh, and we can also call that the cumulative distribution function, or CDF, then we would enter true. So if I want the area shown in the first column here, I would use the true argument in that last input. So try it in Excel. Type this formula. First, the equal sign, then exactly as it's written here. You can pause. So what I'm doing here is asking Excel, hey, if I have a population with a mean of 2 and a standard deviation of 0 0.5, what's the area under the curve less than the value of 3? In other words, what percentage of observations would I expect to be less than 3? When you enter that formula into any cell in Excel, you should get 0 0.9772 as a result. And that's where that 97.72% comes from. Or what if you wanted this value, the greater than z standard deviations away? Well, you just type 1 minus that same formula into Excel. OK, so we can use z-scores just like this. But I'll show you how this concept can be extended to define confidence intervals and do hypothesis testing in the upcoming parts of this session 19. But one more thing before I end part A. What do we do if the data is not normally distributed, but we still want to know what percentage of our observations we can expect to be above or below a certain value? Remember the lengths of stay in the hospital histogram? What if I want to know, for example, what percentage of stays are greater than five days? Can I calculate the z-score for five days and look it up like I did with the blood pressure? No. Our data is not normally distributed, and the z-score is based on the assumption that the data is normal.
so we will not use z-scores in that case. Instead, we can apply the idea of percentiles that we saw in session 18. This table shows the 10th and the 25th and the 50th and so on percentiles of the hospital stay data set. We can see that the 75th percentile is five days. So 75% of the data is less than five days. And so then we would expect about 25% of stays to be longer than five days. And we can generate a table like this one using Excel or any statistics program. So for example, in Excel, you can use the function percentile. And that function requires two inputs. First, it needs all of the data, or all of the observations, so the full data set. And then secondly, what percentile that you want to know. So if you want to know the 50th percentile, you would highlight all the values in, the, in Excel for the first argument, and then type 0 0.5 for the second argument to get that data's 50th percentile. And so the results would be 3 from this data set. In other words, the 50th percentile is three days. Okay, so you should be ready to finish the first question on your inferential statistics practice worksheet now. That's it for part A. Don't forget about the quizzes online. In part B, uh, we'll look at confidence intervals.